Ziggurat of the Ghost Kings by Ben Wheeler Narrated by Ken Dickison Part 1 Nightmare of the Horse God Mazer Valois stood over the high priest of the horse god, Barracks. Cursed stars watched the murder, unbroken by any sun. The traitorous priest's broken body bled out on the temple steps and pooled in the dips of the carvings. His mouth worked itself open and closed until his eyes found Mazer standing over him. The priest had long given up his name, his family, and his history for the power of the dread being. Neon symbols flashed over his empty eyes. The shadow of barracks be with you, as it was with your father. And so he died. The spark, such as it was, passed from his eyes, leaving empty, ink-stained sockets. Mazer raised his head to look at the statue of the sixteen-legged horse deity. The blood and oat-soaked altar glowed beyond the neon tubes, implanted like veins of an anatomic model. The light had no color or glow, and the shadows the light cast were greater than they would have been normally. They shifted and breathed. Though the horse statue had sixteen stone legs, they moved whenever Mazer blinked or focused on the motions of darkness behind it. Mazer couldn't put a finger on the reason for his fear, but he backed down. Was it really just shadows? His sandaled foot slipped on the first step, and his eyes went to the floor. His head snapped up as fast as he could, hair whipping himself in the eyes. His sword was forgotten in the chest of the nameless priest. His ray gun was in his hand, but he knew it to be useless against such evil. He took another step down, blinking away the sweat and dirt flung into his eyes by his wayward hair. Each blink gathered more and more shadows. They grew and heaved like a living thing. They formed upon the altar, where the body of an unfortunate maiden was spread on a bed of oats and hay. Her head, separated from her body, turned to face Mazer, and he shouted in shock. He turned to run down the stairs to the pyramid, ignoring the still panicking worshippers on the tiers and slopes. Princes looked on dispassionately, as their priest's murderer fled nothing. Already, the immortal statues, holding telepresent souls untouchable by any physical threat, only thought of their political games, and a thousand messages flew the mere feet between them, selling and betraying one another. Their lords and nobles did much the same, so that as the common man panicked, they merely reworked their cold equations. Mazer threw off the disguise he had worn to get close to the nameless priest. His father was avenged of one of the conspirators. Years of training, combat, intrigue, and sheer bloody-mindedness had finally borne fruit. Mazer had thought it would have been a burden off of his heart. No, the curse of the dying man had set him to flight. How could a dying man have such power? He could see the darkness cast by the malleable, automated statues, depicting the horse god being pulled away. The absence of light ignored the neon, and the fires made blue and smelly with strange salt concoctions, and instead flowed over them, smothering them. The fires merely died, but the light bulbs shattered. The pyramid of barracks stood alone, surrounded on all sides by featureless fields, full of horses and other related equines. The whole planetoid, given gravity by a black hole at its center, was dedicated to horses. At the bottom of the steps, ships waited for the faithful to depart, including the private cruisers of the unliving princes and the personal sloops and barks of their living servants. Mazer had disguised himself as a knight to enter the landing pads, and his ship lay among their snubby forms. Now he could hear the hoofbeats of a million horses thundering as the shadows continued to be gathered under the hideous horse statue. Its mouth slavered with foam, and its eyes rolled in the strange uncolors of gray and black. Mazer reached the ground, nearly slipping on the churned mud of the devoted's dirt path. He made the docking platform. The guards were too concerned with the altar to stop him. They looked up, gaping. If they did not believe in a god, or their prince's soothsayer before, they did now. 
The air tingled with a snap felt but not quite heard. The hoofbeats grew louder, and beams of inky nothing played over the pyramid, the crowds, and even the ships. For a breath, nothing happened. Then the people screamed as those hit with the beams fell, cut apart and beaten, as if trampled by the horse god himself. The ship of Teradoc Campir, prince of Ultima Rao, slid over itself, its conning towers collapsing into its engines. Mazer could feel the energies building within it, and lightning snapped between the communication veins of its neighboring ships. What vital systems it had hit, and what time he had left, he could not tell. As each ship from Ultima Rao was a work of art, religiously slaved over, but the engines were building power with nowhere to send it. His ship and his droid, Forty Double Ought, waited for him. Doobie whistled at him from the cockpit. I don't know. Get the engine started. I'm not waiting to find out, he said. Another scream arrested him. This one reminded him of an injured horse, trampled under a weight, dying, but not even close to death. His eyes widened. The poor girl he had been unable to save rose into the air. Her left hand held her brunette hair near the scalp, and her eyes blinked, staring straight into Mazer's own orbs. Night gathered around her, and she became clad in shadowy raiment. It flowed down below her torso, and instead of dainty human feet, she gained hooves and the lower body of a horse. One of the gawking guards behind Mazer screamed, <gasps> Nightmare! And threw himself over the side of the platform. The nightmare lifted up the severed head, and it vomited a vile, tarry liquid. Its eyes and mouth glowed with a sickly white light, not enough to illuminate anything, but enough to set them glowing. Mazer vaulted into the cockpit of his nightly snub fighter, the Highlander's delight, and ignored the safety guidelines for takeoff. The nightmare started to move, building up speed and flinging itself down the slope of the pyramid. The body turned as needed, but the head only had eyes for Mazer Valoy. He could feel it coming for him, even when he turned away to fling some lever. Though it had taken him seconds to activate the engines, already the nightmare had passed the halfway mark of the pyramids, past the immortal princes, past the cold dukes and heartless barons, and it flung the peasants, burghers, and artisans out of its way without touching them. Though it only took less than a minute from the start, the engine's rev could not come soon enough. Punch it, Doobie! He pulled up on his joysticks as the nightmare gained the spaceship dock. His engines belched flame, igniting the atmosphere around the exhaust ports and driving him into his momentum couch. He swung the controls around, and the fighter built up speed, swinging around the planetoid and concerned himself only with building enough speed to escape. Clouds burst drenching his ship in short-lived droplets of water, which evaporated off Mazer's craft in a bare second. He crossed the horizons and came to the pyramid once more, before he realized it. The nightmare looked at his escaping craft, staring him in the eyes, and letting him drink deep of the pale light, shining from the eyes and mouth of the sacrifice's head. The headless centaur galloped to the edge of the space dock and took a step out into the atmosphere. First one hoof, and then another, walked on air. Mazer cursed. Hellgate of Lothan! Unlike the Highlander's delight, it needed no build-up of momentum, and it laughed in the face of gravity. It roared towards him, treating the open air as a multi-lane highway, smooth-grained and empty. Its speed outstripped horses, and it gained on him. He broke the atmosphere and reached the ether of space, it normally comforted him. Mazer could be free in the near void, listening to what he liked, and passing by wonders, both humble and awe-inspiring. A planet that boasted the universe's largest rocking chair and best fudge could be as worth seeing as the hidden world of Valkyrian, floating between stars, yet as verdant as old Earth. He pushed the engines to escape the gravitational pull. He'd be safe in the slipstream bubbles his radium drive could conjure. The nightmare followed him into space, stepping on the ether, a thing lighter than protons, as firmly as it did stone or air. Soon, 
It took a face full of fusion wash. Doobie was screaming into his ear. The peace of the void vanished in the noise, and Mazer panicked. The second his radium drive could escape the shadow of the planetoid, he pointed his fighter's nose at a likely star and fired the slip engines. The radium drive whined, and he disappeared into a blue point, shifting himself into speeds unimaginable. Behind, he left the nightmare and the planetoid. The pyramid of barracks and all its evils vanished as the ship from Ultima Rao detonated in a perfectly circular ball of white energy. The whole thing wiped from space, as if sand on a table set for gods. Mazer leaned back into his momentum couch, grateful for its comfort. It would move and prop him up as needed, but Doobie would be sufficient for his navigational needs. How long until we reach another star system? He asked the air. Whistles replied to him. All right. When we arrive, plot a course for Alpha Sepsis. With the High Priest of Barracks dead, we can move on to Serenus, the Snake Charmer. He pulled up images of the men and women who had directly betrayed his father. He did not resent the guards or mercenaries their work, but their captains? Something else. The High Priest had been their inn, using his religious credentials to smuggle in the conspirators and spreading lies to weaken the resolve of his father's council. His father had been suffering bad dreams before his death. Nightmares, even. Mazer's lip curled into a sneer at the name. He X'd the floating photograph in the holographic display. Next, Serenus, with her scarred lip and slitted eyes, met his gaze. She was a performer, and well known to follow a circuit of pleasure worlds. Less well known were her powers of persuasion and mesmerism. How many men had fallen to this black widow? How many had woken up at the end of her performance, wallet and dignity gone? Aye, and had her theater troupe not performed in his father's court on the night of his murder, hiding the murder weapons? He cupped the back of his head in his hands, elbows out. As fortune would have it, Alpha Sepsis lay a hop, step, and jump away from their exit point. He could already imagine meeting her in the night, in an alley or after a performance. Soon, the ghosts... Doobie beeped at him, interrupting the reverie. It's in our slipstream? How? Show me. The holographic stream changed from the floating photos to the rear of the ship. Through Doobie's eyes, he saw the unmistakable form of the nightmare. Her head lantern illuminated a starry path. Though the light had done nothing to the shadows and darkened crags of the pyramid, the nightmare closed in on the Highlander's delight. Each ship, when it activated its radium drive, opened its own stream into the slip space. Like a bubble passing through a pipe, it opened in front and closed behind, and no one could follow and not be destroyed by the tumult of the slip merge. Each step of the hooves onto the diamond dust path brought it far closer than it ever should have been. The hand waved the face in the ship's direction, and the whole thing shuddered, lurching in the slipstream space. The whirlwind of gravitational swirls, of black holes, dark planets, and life-filled solar systems beat at the bow wave of Mazer's craft. Doobie! Where's the near system? We need to get out of the slipstream! His loyal bot whistled quite angrily. I don't care if they have signs of civilization. We can't fight the nightmare in here. The radium engine ground and popped in the sudden full stop. The nightmare pulled itself next to the cockpit. Mazer could see the lines within the black garb it wore. They pumped like the blood vessels, and, despite the gap in the quantum-sealed cockpit, he could smell the gagging rot of death and the thick smell of damp hay. The nightmare turned the head to him, and he looked into its eyes. The prince could feel the weight of a consciousness not of this universe, nor even of something approaching the spirit of humanity that all men feel. It hated him because of its high priest. Much like how a man may hate a bee that has stung his friend. He does not consider the bee, nor why it wanted to sting. Only that it did. The eyes reached out to him, and Mazer shivered in his couch, shaking and convulsing as the head closed on the window. Mazer Valois was insignificant in the cosmos. His vengeance was worthless, evil, even. Even if he would win against the conspirators, would he enjoy a quiet life? Or would he be slain by some daughter of Seranus, or a hidden clone of the usurper, King Kokba, who sat on the throne now? 
without realizing the motion to pull it from his harness. He could feel his ray gun in his hand, about to shoot. The reeling man could not tell where he aimed, whether at the creature, the nightmare, or at his own body. Before the trigger pulled, and the beam ended his life, by heat or by vacuum, Doobie brought them out of the slipstream. Adrift, the Highlander's delight floated in the light of an alien sun. The rays warmed Amazer and brought him comfort. They orbited dangerously close to the corona of a star. But the ship could withstand it while they had power. The nightmare was nowhere to be seen. So Amazer, exhausted, slept. Part 2 The World of Silicon Sleepers Doobie woke him. His loyal droid had completed what repairs it could, but needed to land somewhere to finish up. They wouldn't be able to use the radium drive without his tender care. Mazer pulled up the map of the solar system and plotted a course. The engines had been doing a great job keeping them in place, and the system had been charted by Doobie's navigational scanners. The system had no name on the star chart, but the remains of a primitive solar energy collection system floated in various Lagrange points across the space, which proved inhabitation. Mazer could see one of the vast expanses of golden foil floating in the superheated ether, twisting in the solar winds. The signals led him to an asteroid base near the planet, lying in the Goldilocks zone. The ship passed an inferno giant, which orbited close enough to kiss the blistering edge of the corona. Vast arms of plasma reached around it, flinging webs of fire into the void. Beyond it, several rocky worlds turned in their courses around their light giver. The usual asteroid belt and shepherd giants lay beyond them. The giant was a red fiery mass, warped and bent by the power of the star near it. It wasn't so much a sphere as an ill-formed egg. Mazer watched the clouds roil over it, the red, pink, and white reminding him of bacon and that he had not eaten in nearly twenty-four hours. The triumph and adrenaline of the last few hours had pushed all other thoughts from his mind. A pale light passed over the ship, and the Highlander's delight shuddered, throwing the protein bar out of his hands. Doobie, where did that come from? He looked through the holographic eyes of the ship. Did the nightmare cling to the side? The cargo bay probably could have held it if it were empty, but no. It would have attacked Mazer while he slept. Where was it? Doobie whistled, and an image of the nightmare standing in the shadow of the Inferno Giant. It stood at the edge of the star's light, and stared at its target across the void. The distances, millions of miles, prevented even the supernatural entity perfect accuracy, as the variation of a millimeter was enough to miss. Mazer jerked the controls, avoiding another pass of the beam. Ha! Is it stuck there thanks to the sun? Can it not step into the light of a living star? Maybe it can't cross a running stream or enter churches. He spoke to Doobie, who tiredly whistled. There. Let's jet for that asteroid. If we do this right, we might be able to strand it while we slip out of here. The asteroid had plenty of technology attached to it, but no ship or transport had pinged them. Even the AI running the base did nothing else besides welcome them in and open the bay doors for the Highlander's delight. The lumpy space station crawled with maintenance bots, but no real souled voice welcomed Mazer. The automated systems took control of the ship to bring it in. As the fighter got close, Mazer used his scanners to hit the world below. Nothing. No one moved around on the highways or cities. There were rails, but no trains. Ports were silent. Mazer had a terrible vision of wakefulness, as if the whole thing daydreamed and waited for someone or something to disturb them before they, the inhabitants of the world below, would pick up their tools, fire up their engines, and return to life as if nothing happened. As they closed in on the dock, Mazer saw the nightmare flee its perch on the edge of the star's light. He laughed, thinking that it was going to try to bridge the gap between the Inferno Giant and the asteroid base. Why didn't it pursue him before, if it did not fear the sun? The thing surely would burn in the light. It did not leap, but stepped from one shadow to another. Instead of being in the shadow of the Inferno Giant, it was in the shadow of a geosynchronous moon. Then 
it was dancing from asteroid to asteroid. One of the smaller worlds, akin to Mercury, had a small ring system. Like an acrobat and contortionist mixed together, it ducked and dodged the sun's direct light. Mazer could see the lines of shadow connecting the Inferno Giant with the asteroid base. Dooby, break our connection. The shadows overlap. The bot whistled at him. I don't care what it activates. Get us out of the shadows now. Immediately, the asteroid base unveiled antique flak cannons and sprayed a wall of hot lead between itself and the Highlander's delight. Straining at the controls, Mazer dodged under it, sending his ship into a nosedive toward the planet. Several shots smashed a whole bank of his control thrusters. Doobie screamed. I know! Mazer's tail spun in the barest wisps of the planet's atmosphere. Fire surrounded the cockpit, and he wrestled the stick for control. His arms strained, and both hands needed all their strength to keep it from spinning itself into pieces. Put us on manual! More whistles and screams. The jerking of the stick nearly threw him from his momentum couch. Mazer roared with effort, bringing the control stick under his power. He stabilized the tailspin, barely 100 miles above the surface. There was a burst of fire behind the ship, and the turbulence started to grow, worse than the tailspin had ever been. All the engines were down. He glanced over the scanning equipment and found the city with the most advanced development. It was nearly 50 miles across, the center covered by a massive opaque dome, and, within, a massive five-tier ziggurat squatted, larger than the Pyramid of Bellux had ever been. Mazer could see a break in the dome where it could open and shut, letting in light or a crashing snub fighter. Despite the pressures on him, Mazer checked the shadow lines. The asteroid cast a pretty large one over the continent, but it was far from the domed city. It would have to do. The engines did not respond, but some of the solid fuel thrusters remained. Carefully using up the fuel, the snub fighter slowed. Mazer aimed for the gap in the dome and prepared to bleed as much speed as possible. The air plucked at him, attempting to throw him off course, but he kept his nose true. He could see runes and sigils carved into the sides and foundations of the dome. Skulls and circuitry for the most part. There were no statues, only metaphors and analogies. As they passed, Mazer and Doobie could see the skulls transform. They started with two. Then, three eyes. The circuitry engulfed them, so that they had two eyes and one lens. Over it all, a star with a lump in shape, a representation of their own star, let down burning rays onto a populace of worshippers. No wonder it had looked like a dead world. Mazer looked over the geography. Were these valleys or gouges? Was that blackened spot a forest fire, or the beams of a vengeful sun, angry god alone knows why? Was that low-lying lake bed evaporating, or merely shallow? He saw the dome coming, and focused. Now, the fighter was holding itself steady. The turbulence continued, but it was not so powerful, and his arms, straining, could bring the fighter in at the right angle and the right speed. Past the dome, towers rose to scrape at its bottom. The city displayed no lights, no sign of human life. He could already tell and feel the silence. It is one thing to look on a world and see little. It is another to fly over a dead city. Mazer could see platforms, one on top of each other, lining one side of the ziggurat. He aimed for the largest one and brought his snub fighter nose down towards it. There was a shake, and the last of his fuel burned up. He glided on the still air incapable of slowing down. Hang in there, Doobie! He shouted to his robot. The squat thing in the back beeped at him, expressing a vote of no confidence. Thank you! Unfaithful droid. Mazer popped down the landing gear and prayed that it would be enough. The first jolt lifted him from his momentum couch as the second slammed him back onto it. The third slammed his head against one of his dashboards and he lost consciousness. He awoke to the agitated twittering of Doobie. He popped the hatch, checking first for his ray gun and the dirk Sir Henderson had given him before his quest for revenge. His clothing stank a little of his sweat, 
but not so bad as the stench of the pinging metal and ozone burnt into the skin of his fighter. Now, standing on the dock, he saw that some of the automatic systems had thrown up a foam shield, which drew in the ship and dulled the immense shock. Even as it solidified, the force of the near crash had shattered it, and it fell apart and turned to dust. No one ran out to help them, or check whether fighters had started or not. Doobie, the squat, three-legged purple robot, had already freed itself from the crashed ship. It scanned the ship with one of its tool arms and rolled around, whistling at itself. It turned and faced Mazer, and he could feel the disapproval radiating from its dome, far more than the heat from the ship itself. They parted ways, Mazer trusting his bot to cool down and fix the ship. Perhaps the port had parts to repair radium drive? He walked into the immensity of the first-level spaceport. Where were the people? The cave spanned nearly the full width and height of the first level. Chandeliers of massive tools and fuel pipes hung down from almost 100 feet. He trembled at the sight of it. How powerful the king here had to have been! Along the base of the pillars that supported the machinery and cargo cranes, fleets of forklifts and other vehicles waited for hands that would never come. Machine shops and elevators lined the gaps of the pillars, so that natural bays for even the most massive cargo hauler were open for visitors that would never come. Though it spanned nearly a mile into the ziggurat's immensity, he walked it, searching for an office or computer terminal not dedicated to machines or communicating into the void, where no one responded and no spark of life made itself known to him. Even the AI from the asteroid base did not consider him worth its time to send back a signal. He searched for some control office, some way to open the dome, preferably as the nightmare came for him and could not escape. Mazer disturbed the offices of supervisors and diplomats. None of the machines yielded to him, and their operating systems laughed off his attempts to hack them. He found the main concourse, a wide corridor of gleaming metal and gray flooring. Along each wall, murals and paintings, with a few museum pieces ensconced in glass, told Mazer the history of the world. The humans had fled a world invaded by some alien menace. The last colony ship entered into the slipstream and escaped by the skin of its teeth. It had landed on the planet, and a civilization had grown, leaps and bounds, from its wreckage. They adopted a more free approach to human enhancement, and, thanks to some technology from the alien menace, they soon sported many different enhancements, from third eyes to direct neural links with their machines. Massive war machines, like men writ large, fought each other in land, space, and sea, before the world was united and the ziggurat reigned supreme. The last of the murals depicted a man, more cyborg than human, accepting a crown as his soldiers screamed and pointed at the massive planet passing through the sky. The fluorescent lights flickered, and he felt an intelligence watch him through the hidden cameras, surely set into the walls. At the end of the hall, before the doors to the greater city, crude holographic emitters buzzed awake and stopped Mazer with a red octagon, a universal symbol. Mazer waited on the balls of his feet, ready for an attack or message. A holographic king appeared before him, distorted by static and strange interference. He wore a golden crown, tiered with gems, rubies, sapphires, and diamonds. And in his hand was a scepter, topped with a carefully crafted gem, made to look like the world. His face was much the same as the mural, but older, and a sunburnt scar ruined over one half of his face. Sadness filled his eyes, but a terrible pride still kept his soul intact. Mazer felt an urge to bow, but fought it. He was the son of a king and some day he would sit on his father's throne. The speakers crackled but failed. The king looked on, frustrated. Mazer waited for the ghost to formulate his thoughts. He could hear engines and fans powering up in the depths of the ziggurat. The king pointed deeper, and then he pointed up, around where the peak of the monument around them would be. Now that the king had spoken, Mazer could feel a change in the air. Whatever the king had done, more than the king was aware of him. The vast ziggurat squatted over Mazer, setting his hair and teeth on edge. His hand found his ray gun, and his eyes flicked to the shadows, searching for some foe. Had the nightmare found him already? Part 3 
the steps of the ziggurat. Aware where he hadn't been before, he could feel the pressure of his foe. The unlight that he had seen in the slipstream gave him a sense for it. He could feel it coming closer. It passively waiting for him to come near had not nearly the same feeling as when it had dodged sunlight to come closer to him. Yet, this was not the source of his discomfort. In the depths, the basement, something mechanical and fleshy at once moved, scraping and snapping chains. Mazer almost cursed the king for awakening whatever slept below. But the thought of an intelligence, trapped and waiting for salvation to never come, stopped him from rash words. How long had he trained? How long had he waited until he was a man, and thus enough to wrestle out his revenge? The sounds died away, but now he was aware of every drip, the sound of insect feet scurrying through dry pipes, or even, most worryingly, the sound of scratches, always too low to pick out and identify, but the same slight drone. He passed out of the modern atrium and into deeper, rocky passageways. Long ago, they had attempted to smooth out the rough edges and seal the damage that time had wrought on it. But the tool marks could be felt under Mazer Valois's hand. Not even the fluorescent lights above could reveal the texture differences, while the stones themselves ran smooth and cool. The stones were unnaturally cold, and as he went deeper into the ziggurat, he found himself shivering more and wishing he had not been wearing still the sandals of a barracks devotee. He half-jogged through the underground tunnels. He guided himself by heat, seeking the central stairs of the ziggurat. He breathed at intersections, always choosing the draft where he saw the least of his breath. Finally, he felt a breeze, and the weirdly dimmed light of a sun hidden behind an opaque dome. At that same moment, he heard a step behind him. Just one, nothing else. No breath, no sound of a man readying a weapon or steeling himself against the crime of murder. Rather than stay and see what pursued him, Mazer walked into the light and stood on the carved tiers and steps of the vast monument. The door was recessed and hidden behind the statue of a barbarian king. No human this, but a proud thing with tentacles under his chin and four eyes set into his brow. He held a trident in his hand and in the other, a globe. His clothing was like a toga, but cut to fit his different musculature and strange bones that jutted out of his back for no reason Mazer could tell. He walked out onto the platform. The tunnels must have been curved upward, for he was higher than the vast space dock below his feet. Mazer made the stairs. More sculptures and bas-reliefs lined the walls. The tentacled aliens were the primary subject. They were a cruel people and nearly all of their art held weapons, or were shown leading slaves, or eating a strange beast, perhaps a servant species. Pressure bore down on Mazer's soul, and he knew that the power that the king had stirred to life below came near to him. He turned to the right, and the nightmare grew nearer. He could almost see it flit from the bare shadows thrown out by tree branches to the ruins of a nearby city. It would be there soon. Behind him, a step echoed in the silent city. He turned to it and saw a hand, riddled with cybernetic lines of silicon-like veins, clutch at the corner of the ziggurat, where he had exited the tunnels. With an awful slowness, the face, with three eyes, one artificial, gnashed its teeth, silently and viciously, like chewing a tough steak. The living eyes did not move, but the one of silicone and glass did, and affixed Mazer with a stare of pure, murderous rage. He heard a whisper. His ear heard English, but archaic. Who disturbs the slumber of the stasis sleepers? Who walks where nothing is to walk for one hundred years more? Do you not know that the star is set to strike this very location in but a few minutes' time? Stirred to life, violence by Vulcan. Did the king wake up and dream that he still had authority before the safe hours? No matter. Your life is forfeit, and your body will be sent to the flesh pits, and protein fed to the slumberers. The head disappeared, but Mazer looked, and along every side, panels on hidden tracks opened, 
revealing others like the first, each gnashing their teeth, each whispering the same vile threats in a drone. Each of their human eyes were blank, closed, or staring. Only one intelligence pursued him. Mazer fired his ray gun, putting a thin heat beam into the knee of the nearest sleeper, sending it pitching forward, without cry of pain or any sign that it had been hurt. The rest did not turn to assist their fallen comrade, nor did they turn their eyes from Mazer at all. He ran up the stairs. More of the sleepers crept from hidden banks, some still dripping some sort of amniotic fluid that stank of raw protein and blood. Others bore the marks of surgery and cuts with whatever horrid enhancements the AI spirit afflicted them. Their deathly eyes haunted Mazer, for he had always been taught to look into a man's eyes, but their emptiness set him to stumble. The threats meant nothing to him, for he felt the nightmare close, perhaps even now stepping on the cobbles of the city. He passed the third tier, firing into the non-vital places of the body. He didn't know how much of the soul, the human, remained in their silicon-ravaged bodies. Each fell without gasp or cry, and crawled without pause towards him. He punched one, and felt the snap crack of breaking plastic, and brittle near metals, as his fist broke the chin. The jaw flapped, the skin tearing like tissue paper, and not even a drop of blood flew from the force of the blow. Mazer's knuckles crumpled the bone so easily, he was reminded of a paper mache dummy more than of a body. He stopped. The horror of a body that was merely the hollowed remnant of a man or woman, sickening him. The joints of the jaw and the roots of the teeth were laid bare to him. A claw plucked at his heel, and blood pooled under his sandal. Mazer cried out and vaulted the jawless slumberer in front of him. His heel and thews collapsed at the landing. His tendon had been scored, but not cut all the way. His eyes bringing up firing solutions and aiming lines fast as thought. He fired his ray gun into the third, false eye of the sleeper, with blood on her claw. It collapsed and moved no more. He struggled back up and saw, in the streets, in between the skyscrapers and heading his way, the nightmare. Galloping, she held her head high, and the pale light sought him, occasionally grazing his body with the deathly power. The cobblestone streets saved him, for they threw off her aim, and the pale light passed over some of the sleepers, making them jerk and fall over each other. Madness and chaos struck the ranks of the walking cybernetic bodies, and they convulsed, falling over each other, some getting on their hands and knees, others staring back into the light-eyed face. Those untouched by the light moved their brittle bones faster. Mazer broke into a run, hoping that his ankle would hold against the wound. His ray gun fired into the third eye of any who stood in front of him. There was a scream, more felt than heard, like the braying of a dying horse. He knew the nightmare had made the steps of the ziggurat. Mazer made the top, not stopping to stare at the dreadful statues of the dark gods, imperiously staring down at the masses. All around him, cruel lines, spikes and altars, lined the avenue above. Barely visible on the black stone, stains ruined the flat tops and the floor under his sandaled feet. In front of Mazer, a man slept in stasis sleep. His brow was noble and held a crown of gold and diamond. The shining lights, hexagonal and glassy, kept the king untouched by time and the worst of entropy. Lines of wire and cord ran from the ziggurat to his throne, and in front of the raised dais, they had stationed a control panel. Mazer nearly slammed into it and steadied himself on the platform. He risked a glance behind him and saw the nearest sleepers convulsing, as if in the grip of a stroke. The unaffected sleepers stared at him without blinking. They did not cross the threshold. Some even placed their hands in the open air. Light that was not light flashed over their heads. The nightmare was near. He searched the panel for some command that could solve his problems. Above, he could see sunlight streaming through the cracked opening of the dome. It was not high noon, and even then, he could see the sun obscured by the presence of Vulcan, the Inferno Giant. He found a button labeled 
release, with the image of a crown on top of it, and pressed it. A second passed, and Mazer turned, finding the nightmare gaining the top of the ziggurat. It slowed down, driving Mazer back. The blank face could display no pleasure, no anger or emotion, but it stalked him all the same. With the same English as the sleeper that had spoken to him earlier, Mazer heard the king murmur. You did it. I am free. Open the dome. I saved you. I need your help. Open it now as fast as you can or I'll die. For honor and God's sake. Mazer screamed. The king's head still nodded with the dregs of sleep. The king saw the strange shadowy monster walking towards his savior and grimaced his mind coming up to speed. Mazer could see no sign of the king coming to his aid. The nightmare paid the throne no heed, but came closer and closer. The growing smell of death and smoke overwrote Mazer's senses. Holes poked through the body of the nightmare, where sunlight had caught it, unprotected. The head in its hands stared at Mazer as he crawled away. He did not know when his legs had collapsed, but he barely had enough strength to hold up his ray gun and shoot beams of light and heat into the body of the nightmare, which absorbed the gunfire without stopping or slowing. The free hand grabbed Mazer and lifted him up by his neck. He choked and sputtered as his neck bones creaked, cartilage barely resisting the shadowy hand. The head came close and he felt the unlighted eyes run over his skin and head. He had closed his eyes against it, but still saw the pale beams behind the eyelids. He opened them, and saw the despair dwelling in the dark underneath the skin of the universe. What use was the small deeds of small men if they served none of the gods, but the minuscule one in their own hearts? Vengeance only served entropy, and even if he won, what was the use of spending his life fearing the children of those he killed? What's more, would his people even welcome back a murderer? Would they remember his father and would they love him? The sun touched his back, then his neck, dissipating the shadowed hand and dropping him down to the hooves of the headless centaur. The decapitated head opened its mouth in a silent scream. It backed away from the sun, awkwardly, on four wounded hooved feet. Mazer found the dirk in his hand and reached behind him, reflecting direct sunlight from the blade onto the arm that held the head. The light cut the head from the hand with a straight cut. The beast forgot that the other hand had disappeared, dripping a black ichor from its stump, and reached for the falling head. Yet, it feared the sunlight. Mazer dived for it and caught it by the hair. He twisted and threw the head behind him, the nightmare unleashed a psychic scream and charged after it. The head and body entered the sunlight together. The body convulsed, and head and body turned to smoke, then passed away as if a wind had blown it into nothing. Mazer felt like he could vomit. He staggered up onto his feet and practically hugged a column until his head and soul had stopped spinning. He walked to the king and bowed, holding onto his knees as a wave of weakness hit him again. Thank you. By your leave, sir. I'll be repairing my ship and leaving. The silicon zombies collapsed behind them, and Mazer trod carefully between their corpses. The king had not said anything to him, his eyes distant. Mazer saw the lines of code pass over his eyes, and the dome closed over them. Above, a bright light shone through the dome and splashed against the dome. Heat washed over them. But it was bearable. As soon as it began, it ended. He could see, in the far distance, fires and melted slag. The clouds were gone, and the clear sky burned above. Mazer descended the ziggurat, stepping lightly between the empty corpses of the silicon zombies. When he arrived at the dock, he helped Doobie repair the radium drive and the damage from the crashed landing. The droid seemed happy to see him living, beeping and whistling in a tune. Whenever the droid didn't need his help, he sat on the edge of a wing of the Highlander's Delight, kicking his legs. Mazer knew the face of Seranus and all the other conspirators. His body was tired and wounded, 
but there was only so much he could do. In his mind, he replayed what he saw, deep in the eyes of the galloping nightmare. He didn't have to avenge his father. Not really. A part of him wanted to run away from it. To flee, as he did from the nightmare. No. But that would be living as a beggar. Never coming to the aid of his people. Never overthrowing the usurper Kokba. He didn't even know if his people were suffering. Surely they had to be. But they had murdered his father. Kokba had been the steward of the realm. Was anything denied to him? He did it just to earn a larger crown. Lazarine for her wars. Mazina, because he coveted Mazer's mother. Saranus, for money. The nameless high priest of Berex? Who knew what motivated that enigma? He hadn't even accepted bribes. Mazer Valois hardened his heart. Doobie whistled all was well with the engines. The dome cracked open for them as they jetted away. Certainly he could have lived as an honorable beggar, far more honorable than an assassin. But he could also live as a prince, and then a king. He could live as he was supposed to live. It was not useless to remember what had been taken from him, because it meant he had something to fight for.